Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, so, you know, I, I have this, this ice cream sundae that I make for myself once in a blue moon. Are you eating it right now? You know, I already finished it. Oh. But... It's very yummy. Well, I'm super impressed. <laughs> it's it's you did vanilla. It, do you have to have any sort of are there any any constraints that you work under on this uh, for this uh, Sunday? Well, it's I have it's two ingredients. I use vanilla ice cream, preferably French vanilla, if uh -huh. I have. Uh -huh. Do you and like the little specks? I, I like that. Yes. Okay. And molasses. 
Well, that's not a Sunday. It's, it is. You that's put not, topping on ice, ice cream, cream with it, a topping. That's not a right, Sunday. That makes, that makes a Sunday. It does not make a Sunday. A Sunday has extravagance and frivolousness and whipped cream and a maraschino cherry. This is a simple Sunday. Oh, it's simple. <laughs> that's a, a two-ingredient <laughs> Sunday, and I named it the Holstein because it looks well, like you know a, a cow. cow. Yeah, <laughs> I can, I can see it. I actually, I came up with it for a script that I wrote years ago. Years ago, Did it's you? just a, yeah. It's my Did little you? Sunday that I I partake every once in a blue moon, and tonight was that blue moon. Oh, I'm I'm happy for you. It's quite what nice. I was it asking. Oh well, I was asking about constraints because usually when I make myself fancy desserts, it's because my family's out of town. Mm, those sorts of constraints. <laughs> yeah, I'm cheating. Well, my constraint was I had to do it with no one seeing me, so there was a little bit of that. With no one seeing you, like children. Yeah, I didn't want that. And they were getting ready for bed, and so I had to sneak into the kitchen and make it, and sneak back to the office without them seeing that I'm carrying a bowl of ice cream. <laughs> the legendary stories handed down by my in-laws uh, to us, unfortunately, in front of our children, was this story of how they used to put my wife and her sister to bed, and then come downstairs and eat ice cream. But because they would like hear the kids walking around after bedtime or something, they would hide it in the sink because the kids were too small to see it. Mm -hmm. And and that's become sort of a thing of lore. Now, my children, they know that story, and they don't trust us at all. <laughs> Not at all. They're constantly looking behind our backs in the sink. They're checking in cabinets where food may be hidden. <laughs> it's terrible. They're on to you. They are. It has been a big week. It's been the best of times, and it's been the worst of times. Boy, has it? Where would you like to start? Oh, we should start with Robin Williams. Oh my God, that's just like uh, it's it it hit me <sighs> more than any other uh, celebrity who has died in the last uh, I don't know many years. You yeah. know, I, I I was really surprised at how strongly it hit me. But man, you look at the stuff that he's done, um, and having come off of two films where we talked about him at length, I know. Uh, it just oh man, it really rattled me, and just the whole you know, um, how it happened. And, and now with his wife saying that he, uh, you know, had just uh, onset of Parkinson's and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, you, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's a weird thing uh, when you look at the scale of celebrity, right. And it, w the, the sort of personal attachment that you develop to these people who've never met you. Uh, you know, we kind of joke about the my best friends who haven't met me list, but that that really is is what I'm thinking of when I think of of people like Robin Williams that that really directly impact me when they pass, and just the the remembrance of his work this week has been um, exhilarating and traumatizing. If you haven't listened to it, the uh, Mark Maron, uh, did you listen to Mark Maron's WTF episode on uh, with Robin Williams? No, I haven't. You you must do it. It was back in 2010, and he re-released it this week in his podcast feed. Just search for for WTF in in iTunes or in um, in your podcatcher of choice. It was, it's not the most current episode, but the the one right before the current episode, he re-released the Robin Williams episode, and it's, uh, it, it's, I just can't stop. I feel like I need to listen to it on repeat. Like it's it is as much a wonderful. Um, story about his youth as a as a you know working comedian as it is um, just this you know wandering down this path of drugs and addiction and alcohol and and depression and and all of those things it was it's a very candid interview to have come out in 2010 uh, wow and clearly prescient jeez so anyway. very interesting very interesting thoughts are with the the Williams family and. Zelda in particular, who has apparently been taking the brunt of a lot of really horrible, hateful speech uh, through social media. Um, yeah, I, I don't understand where people... I don't either. ...get that, but yes, yeah. thoughts are with all of them and their family yeah. and their friends and everyone who was in their circles. Um, and then immediately <laughs> after, Lauren Bacall. Oh, yeah. There's another one. Not That, that one was dignified yeah i mean she was uh, how old was she again like 89 80, 80, i thought it was 86 but or eight, yeah somewhere in her 80s but uh yeah she uh definitely 
uh, you know, was a, a very classy lady right up to the end. And, right uh, up to the end. That was the yeah. truth. Yeah. yeah. She was uh, always a, a, a stunning woman and always classy and just, you know, she was always a great presence to see on screen or just in, in the interviews, whatever. She just always kind of carried herself very well. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, I don't. I don't think that this is a good segue. Uh, but let's talk about zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's not really. I regret. A... <laughs> I regret that already. <laughs> <laughs> I I backed your Kickstarter, my friend. It's not really right. directly yours, right? But your producer. It's, you have a producer not. credit. Uh, on one of the shorts in it. Yeah. yeah. So talk about this. Uh, the zombie map app. Yeah, so uh, so a buddy of mine, Rose, is making this uh, app, and he's doing a Kickstarter for it. It's called the Zombie Map app, which the whole point of is to basically make uh, zombie short films and then uh, basically, like, put it in this in this app where you can say oh i shot this here in phoenix and then people can go oh look the zombies are spreading here's the here's another report of an outbreak in phoenix and people can watch that short film and anyone in the world can do it and and so you know for this startup he had i think about 30 filmmakers make zombie shorts and uh, the film that we did, uh, The Most Important Meal of the Day, was the first one released uh, a few days ago. <laughs> and I pretty think, good, I think about too. Four, four or five <laughs> zombie shorts in there now. And, uh, yeah, every day they're releasing a new zombie short film as they, uh, you know, tag them on the little map and then get people excited about this app. So, you know, it's, it's something that for people who love zombies, it's a really fun way to just kind of get a sense of what, uh, you know, people are making as far as zombie fan films, really. And it's got this like great thing on it where, you know, you can get notifications on your phone when a new outbreak has happened within your area, i.e. somebody has made another film and tagged it into your area, but yeah. you can watch, they already have films from, um, around the country, plus you know New Zealand and uh, a couple other parts of the world, people are kind of getting into this and getting their short films uh, attached to this project. So, well, I think it's great. What, so, what happens if he doesn't get funded? Because people are making these movies and tagging them. I guess they would make the movies anyway. He's he's still moving forward with it. The idea, though, is oh, to it's going to be ad supported, isn't right? It? Right, it's going to have to be ad supported. Lame. Uh, yeah, and nobody likes ads, so he's, he's pushing to get this made with no ads, so that people can enjoy uh, their their zombies free of advertisements. Wow. Well, whatever gets it made, I think it's super fun. And as you know, I celebrate the entire oeuvre yes. of uh, the uh, uh, zombies, and so I'm uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I, well, I, I, I mean, it what other genre is more uh, suited? for run and gun cell phone like movie making. Really. Well, the the fun thing is that it's it's beyond just a genre of filmmaking. I mean, within zombie the zombie films, yeah. I mean, you you can pretty much make any genre. You can have zombie comedies, you can have zombie horror films which are kind of the obvious ones, uh Romantic. zombie dramas. Yeah, there's We've there's all those. these different types of zombie films right. that people can make now. And so clearly it, you know, it's designed to appeal to everyone. I like it. Yeah. Hey, can they, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say you can go to Kickstarter and you can search for it or uh, you can search for Zombie Map on Facebook and you can find information about it there if you're interested in learning more. I don't, uh, I don't want to spoil the most important meal of the day. <laughs> I just want to say creepy. <laughs> that wasn't like We're your good. Ha- that wasn't your house, right? It was not my house. <laughs> <laughs> I would never go in that room again. That's all I'm right. saying. <laughs> hey, uh, we got uh, just some other news, a little bit, a little minor news. And I know your inner child is still on probation. No, but my inner child, I let my inner child out for this one. Did you really? I did. Oh my gosh. I was so excited when I saw this. I can't even tell you. So, you know, uh, do you want to talk about it since you've lost? <laughs> you you go ahead. <laughs> so I don't even know how the whole thing worked because I I thought it, it, there is no way I will ever win because surely everyone in our generation around the planet 
is going to try to go for this. I'm talking, of course, about the Star Wars A Force for Change um, uh, contest. So I guess what, what was the deal? Like you submitted your your name as somebody who really, really loves Star Wars and you donate something to raise money for this cause. You Well, you donate money. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so it's like pay 10 bucks and you can You're entered. Get, enter to win. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yeah, you could just donate however much you wanted, you know. Fifty thousand yeah. dollars. It's kind of almost like a Kickstarter. I think some right. levels of donation uh, you could actually. I think fifty thousand. You could uh, have a private screening of the new Star Wars film with J.J. Abrams or something. Like yeah. That. Okay. So uh, okay. So there were there were multiple levels there, and so what, one of the one of the spots that you could win is a part. Uh, they would fly you to the set, and they would give you a walk on part. In the in the J.J. Abrams Star Wars movie. Well, so. I think I think that it was not something. I think everybody gets entered to win that. It's just how many times you're entered to win, depending okay. on how much you donate, because it's all in ten dollar increments. I believe. Oh, so you could stack it in your favor by if exactly. you were super wealthy. Well, yes. All right. So I, as I mentioned, I did not play because I thought there's no way I'm ever going to win. What are the odds? And I am forced today to ask myself uh, that question again, uh, as. My dear, dear, dear childhood friend, D.C. Barnes, the fellow with whom I made many terrible films in my youth, actually won this adventure and will be flown, as far as I hear from him, uh, as soon as next month to the set to do his walk-on part. Doesn't know where it is, as far as I know. He hasn't been told. Uh, but uh, that that's coming. And he's uh, he has agreed uh, to join us and talk about his experience. It may be a very short conversation because I have to imagine he won't have much that he will be able to say. Right. But uh, as soon as he does that, he's going to join us on the show and talk a little bit about, uh, about his experience on the set. I told him uh, as long as he hugs JJ for me real, real tight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we'll be, we'll be in good shape. So uh, my uh, big hats off uh, to DC. Um, totally, you know, I mean, I know there are a lot of people out there saying, I totally deserve it. DC totally deserves it. And people, he's going to represent well. That's what that's I'm saying. Exciting. That's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. And you, the, the video, we'll put, you know, we'll put a link to the video in the, in the notes on the site. Uh, the video is fantastic because it talks about, because it shows him being surprised at work. He's a, uh, he's an editor at a, a very nice production house in Denver. And, and uh, they walk in on this conference and while he's on a call with the producers or some, some part of the production team uh, on, you know, wherever they are, he's doing it like a Google hangout or something with them. And, and they all surprise him and it's, it's really Quite gleeful. It is a moment of great, great glee. It definitely is. Yes, it is. Definitely Very is. excited. That's right. awesome. That's. I think that's all I have. Yeah. You want to tell the people where we're from? Where are we from? Hey, uh, welcome everybody. It's the next reel. Uh, my name's Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Howdy ho! And we spoil movies, and we're very excited tonight. We're kicking off a new series, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, Clint Eastwood uh, Man with No Name series trilogy, uh, Sergio Leone, with a fist full of dollars tonight. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to talking about this film. Uh, before that, though, you need to head over to thenextreel.com. You need to read the blog stylings of the Once Future King, Steve Sarmento. You need to uh, subscribe to the show on iTunes. You can subscribe for free. Make sure you don't miss a single episode. And you know what? Unlike some shows, we have every single episode of our show. You can go back to episode one if you want to and start from there, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I don't even remember when it was. Sometime in the late 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Was that long ago? It was huh? that long ago, 1890. Uh, we started the show, and you could start from there if you wanted to. Hundreds of hours of filmic entertainment, uh, if you're not being too judgy. Uh, and you could start there if you want. So you subscribe for free and uh, and, and catch up. Uh, you should head over to Twitter or Facebook, join the conversation, uh, the next reel on both of those places, and most importantly, the Instagram hashtag Guess the movie, hashtag pony prize, Andy versus the people. How'd you do? You know, I didn't do too bad this week. I, I had, you know, 
a couple really fun images right at the beginning that really threw people in lots of fun directions. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's always the you. aim. you. <laughs> well, a dog on a hillside. You know, I love, you know, uh, Hunt Thug Nasty gave us, you know, every possible animal lost trying to find his way home movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just... Lassie, Babe, Fido, Turner, and Hooch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, image four, uh, Alexander C. Curran uh, figured it out. It was uh, Kevin Costner's 2003 Western Open Range. Well, you're setting it up a little Western action already. I was. And there's a little tie to the Terry Gilliam series because Michael Jeter was also in Open Range. Oh, is that the, uh, that's the fifth image there? That is the fifth image. Yep. Uh, there he is. That's old Michael nice. Jeter. Nice. Well played, yeah. sir. Well Played. Look at that. Tying it all together. See oh, how I did that? God, like a storyline with like villagers and subplots. Oh, yeah. Oh. You have one queued up for next week already? Not at all. Excellent. <laughs> it's going to be a good night. That's what I'll be doing all night. <laughs> Let's do trailers. Uh, you know what? I was. I have so many movies I wanted to talk about this week, uh, Andy. Yeah, I think you could too. tell because I stacked. <laughs> I was mistyping. The one I was going to talk about was this uh, Frank, but I'm not going to talk about because that opens tomorrow, and I missed that. Yeah. So I'm not going to give that. But but let's see what I did there. I, that was a little sleight of hand. I, I saw how you doubled that up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very clever. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about another music trailer that I am weirdly excited about: Rudderless. Uh, stars, uh, stars. I, I don't know how this billing order ended up getting. It, it, they say it stars Selena Gomez, but really it stars Billy Crudup and Anton Yelchin, uh, who uh, Billy Crudup plays a dad who loses his son in a school shooting. Uh, and it, co- it takes place apparently at a university, college or university, and and uh, over the years of his recovery, he discovers that his son had been writing a lot of music, and he starts playing that music uh, out in. Coffee houses. Anton Yelchin is another musician, and they develop a relationship. It ends up being a song about them playing the songs of his his uh, deceased son, and it it looks I, I personally because I'm a sucker for these kinds of movies. It looks very moving, uh, but then you throw in the fact that it's uh, William H Macy's directorial debut, and that gets me very very excited. So uh, I'm really curious about this film. I'm I'm excited to see uh, where we go. From here, and it looks like it hits. Uh, I don't know what's been going on with this this film. Like it should have have been out already, but I think it hits theaters and iTunes simultaneously in October. Hmm. Interesting. It looks good. I, I you know, it it threw me. I wasn't really sure what to expect with it. Um. It. it you know. I I felt like there was a thriller coming on. <laughs> right at the end of the trailer, it's like a weird the, thing. No, before the end, like when he's when Anton Yelchin sees him playing in the coffee house. I like totally was convinced that like he was the school shooter or something, and that there was some going to be some weird tie that was going to oh. tie it all together, and and uh, it that's threw me really in a totally different direction. I well, that's the direction I felt it was going, and then all of a sudden it, they started singing together, and I was like, okay, and they I sound think I really mis- good. I think I misread this movie entirely. <laughs> Well, it it doesn't bode well. I don't think that uh, that it has seen as many delays as it has. Um, but still, I'm excited for it to come out. The music sounds great. They sound great. Don't know if they're actually singing. Uh, well, Billy Crudup already proved he can sing. In, yeah, uh, but I famous. but I don't know about uh, Anton Yelchin. Although I find that dude supremely talented, like around every corner. Yeah, he I agree. has uh, quite a range. So I would not be surprised at all. Yeah. And Lawrence Fishburne, period. Yeah. Boom. So that's it. That's mine. What do you got? Mine is just, you know, a fun little time travel movie that <sighs> you know, it excites me quite a bit. Um, it's it's uh, a film by the uh, the brothers uh, who directed Daybreakers. The, uh, the, I don't know how you say it, the Spirig brothers, Michael and Peter Spirig. They um, wrote and directed Daybreakers, which wasn't uh, like a... A, a fantastic movie, but it was a really interesting spin on the vampire genre. And I really enjoyed that about that film. And so I don't know. I, I kind of, uh, I saw this, this, uh, 
trailer and I saw their names, I'm like, oh, okay. Very interesting that they're now looking at or making this film about the time travel genre, and I'm hoping that they're going to put another unique twist on this as well. Um, Ethan Hawke is in it. He plays a temporal agent who basically is jumping back and forth in time basically, from the the appearance of it kind of stopping crimes before they happen is kind of the seems to be the idea of the story. And uh, he has, uh, you know, this is his final assignment. You know, we see this, I don't know how many times in movies and he's got to pursue the one criminal that has eluded him throughout time. The story sounds a little kind of by the books, but from the trailer, it looks really interesting because it looks like he's bringing on this, this rookie and kind of teaching her the ropes uh, played by Sarah Snook. I guess she's an Australian newcomer. And there's something about the relationship in there that I find really fascinating. And I don't know, the, the time travel stuff just looks really cool. The way that they kind of move through time looks very interesting. And uh, I don't know. I, and Noah Taylor's in it. I, I, I have high hopes for it, and I hope that it can meet them. I, you know, I do too. I'm fascinated by this film. It looks, uh, it, it looks really interesting. And we've, we've seen, uh, Sarah Snook, uh, before and she, I mean, she's been in a number of things, but, uh, she was in a piece with some, uh, controversy, uh, Sleeping Beauty in 2011. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that film? I, I do. That was, I didn't see it, but I remember it. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, different. Um, yeah. very different and lots of, of uh, critical controversy around that film um, but she was uh, her performance in it was terrific and um, so she she does good work and she looks like she plays a very interesting character in this film and or or uh, a range of looks for her I don't know how the time travel plays into that but she looks uh, really interesting she does she does yeah I'm definitely looking forward to it it looks like it's a uh getting its Australian release in August. Uh, it, it played at uh, South by Southwest, but it doesn't have a U.S. release date yet. So let's hope that it's uh, sometime this fall, because I definitely want to go see this one. Absolutely. All right, Andy. Let's go eat some spaghetti. This short cigar belongs to the man with no name. This long gun belongs to the man with no name. This poncho belongs to the man with no name. Rico! Don't you want to see me? What's wrong, Ramon? You losing your touch? Shoot to kill, you better hit the heart. Aim for the heart or you'll never stop me. The man with no name. Danger fits him like a tight black glove. He is, perhaps, the most dangerous man who ever lived. I don't think it's nice you laughing. You see, my mule don't like people laughing. He gets the crazy idea you're laughing at him. Now, if you apologize like I know you're going to, I might convince him that you really didn't mean it. My mistake, four coffins. This man with no name is played by Clint Eastwood. He's going to trigger a whole new style in adventure. A fistful of dollars is the first motion picture of its kind. It won't be the last. A fistful of dollars per un pugno di dollari. What do you think wow, just I don't, like I don't, a real Italian. I, it's nothing like a real Italian. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, first of the No Name Trilogy. Um, uh, it is Sergio Leone's uh, response to the uh, aging uh, and, in his view, uh, decrepit uh, Western industry in Hollywood in the United States. And so here we are um, uh, with him taking, his, taking a whack at the Western uh, with uh, Clint Eastwood. Yeah. This was 1964. Um, what do you think? I love it. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it is Yojimbo. I mean, it really is. I, oh, I, yeah. just, I just watched Yojimbo again. And, I mean, it's just, there are so many scenes and lines that are, you know, really direct copies just direct copies. it is now of course yojimbo was uh um kurosawa's uh film from 
What was the year? You know off the top of your head? Of Yojimbo? Of Yojimbo. This is the Samurai. 1961. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, so Fistful of Dollars comes out 1964. Um, and, uh, you know, in Europe at least. And it, it really is, I mean, it's a, it's a direct... Uh, grab. It is such a direct grab, in fact, that uh, uh, that Sergio Leone gave up. Uh, I think Japanese rights or Asian rights. I think Japanese rights to the film in uh, when it released I think, in Japan. I think uh, Kurosawa, because yeah, Kur- Kurosawa filed a plagiarism lawsuit. And I yeah. think he won a share of all worldwide rights, and then he had all the rights for. Uh, I think it was most of Asia, I believe. Yeah. So there's some there is some controversy there, and and uh, you know given the given the loss, I mean it seems mildly justified. At the same time, uh, Fistful of Dollars does some some interesting things, and I'm I am uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on on what the European sensibility does to the Western. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, Sergio Leone said, uh, this is a quote, he said, the Americans have always depicted the West in extremely romantic terms with horses with horses that run to its, his master's whistle. They've never treated the West seriously, just as we have never treated the ancient Rome seriously. Perhaps the most serious debate on the subject was made by Kubrick in the film Spartacus. The other films have always been cardboard fables. It was this superficiality that struck and interested me. So... Yeah, I think that's what his thing was. I mean, he loved westerns. Don't you know? Don't get me wrong. He was a huge fan of the westerns, like a lot of people around the world. Um, but you know, westerns had been the the popularity had been flagging. I think that in 1950 uh, there was like 150 westerns released, and in, by 1963 there were only 15 westerns released in uh, in the U.S. And so that really kind of shows how that popularity of that genre that had largely um, driven a lot of that early, um, um, you know, dollar in cinema um, had really just kind of uh, dropped in popularity because I think that the stories were really just so similar that people were just not that interested in them anymore. And I think it speaks volumes that when you look at the films that have been released from all those years, you don't see 150 Westerns from 1950 sitting on the shelf. You know, I I think probably a lot of them are kind of lost in time because, uh, you know, they are kind of forgettable. And I think that's something that... um, an outsider sees a little easier. And like he said, he noticed that with Spartacus, that that Kubrick took, uh, and Dalton Trumbo, who wrote the script, uh, you know, took a look at Rome and saw something within that world that the Italians had not been portraying. I mean, if you look at Colossus of Rhodes, uh, that a, a film that Leone had done before, it's, I mean, I don't know if I'd strictly call it a a roman film but it definitely has that european kind of uh you know the the old kind of historical storytelling style it's very cheesy it's not that great of a movie and i think that it must have been spartacus and he saw that and saw how somebody an outsider was looking at his own genre that made him kind of look hey look at this western genre it is completely fictional what these guys are doing let's tell it in an interesting way where it's much more violent where there isn't this black and white with the characters you know there's not the the white uh the the good guy wearing the the tall white hat and the bad guy wearing all black let's kind of mix it up a little bit and so you've got this hero of the story that is really uh, kind of in a way almost as despicable as the bad guys. I mean, he's like instigating this war between parties, trying to get everybody to basically kill each other and then killing people who don't kill themselves, kill each other. Um, although he does have a good streak, you know, there is that element where he saves the family. And, and so, well, and we can, we can talk about that. I, I don't necessarily, yeah. you, you know, it's, that is a funny twist on heroism. Um, but first, just, just in terms of the mechanics of the film, because I think the mechanics of the film of, of sort of good versus bad when it's really mostly bad versus bad, uh, mm-hmm. it, is, is one of the defining characteristics of, um, of, this the the genre right of of what the europeans did to the western uh which is to to twist it right where the innocence in the film the typically the white hats or the good the innocence in this film really are just stuck in a universe of fear 
right? They just, yeah. that's, that's the setup that, that anything good. And, it, and this film opens with this beautiful and patient, uh, sequence where, uh, Eastwood walks up on to the, um, to a well to quench his thirst. And he sees uh, a child running between these two houses that are really convenient to one another, like the worst neighbors ever. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about why in a little bit, but, um, the, uh, and so they live right close to each other and the, the kid is running back and forth and you can see, I mean, as the, the kid and his father are immediately beaten uh by you know bad guys um you can see that this universe that eastwood's character is walking in i'm going to just call him joe uh that joe is walking in on is is um uh is bad what we don't know yet is and and this is one of the sort of defining films of the genre we we don't understand yet that really he is motivated uh by not much better he is the protagonist but not the good guy yeah, uh, which I think is really interesting, and and uh, you know, as he's driven by money, just as the bad guys are, and most of the film is set up, uh, you know, as uh, him playing the two bad guys, who again, terrible neighbors, right across the street from one another. Uh, he plays these two gangs off of one another, and uh, at the cost of getting himself beaten silly, he does end up uh, end up uh, getting away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Leone said, and this definitely comes into play with the other two films we'll be talking about, in particular, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, um, but he said it, what interested him was demystifying these adjectives, good, bad, ugly. What do they really mean? Everybody has good, bad, and ugly in them, and I like that he's lo exploring that with these characters. Eastwood is basically, or Joe, is basically kind of going into town looking at it as an opportunity to make some money. Right. And, uh, you know, how can, I, how can I play this to my advantage? And so he does become that anti-hero that we kind of are rooting for him, even though he's <laughs> doing some bad things. But he's not doing things that are as bad as what the other two are, as Ramon or uh, the Baxters. And so he's definitely um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, is that anti-hero. And then, you know, he does have that, uh, that uh, he sees that family in need, and as much as he may despise their weakness or whatever, he does go out of his way to save them. Well, yeah, and I, I don't necessarily think that he despises the weakness. I just think they make it a very clear point that, um, that Eastwood, in this case, is motivated because of some specific incident in his history, right? And so the, the sequence that we're talking about here is, um, you know, he discovers that through... Um, shenanigans by the gangs the this rival gang lead uh has or head has uh, essentially kidnapped uh this woman and made her live as a as his hostage and the father and son uh are forced to live in hiding in this house essentially across the street uh they can't they can't be seen or else they get beaten up et cetera et cetera and so um eastwood in the end, when he learns all of this, he, he ends up, uh, you know, freeing the woman and telling them to go across the border. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Um, and, and he says, you know, I was, someone wasn't there for me once. Uh, and, and you get this feeling that he lived through a very similar time and was motivated by his own psychology. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know that that because of the setup of the rest of this film, and I think this is a good thing. I don't know that that necessarily leads you to believe that he would do that, uh, that, that he has a good streak, but he's right. motivated by, you know, whatever's right in front of him at the time. And I think that makes him for a more interesting character. Yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting character trait. And interestingly, the only real bit of backstory we get about this character at all, which I find really fascinating that we don't get anything except that one line. Yes. And from that one line, we just kind of can paint this whole picture of what his history is. Um, and, I, you know, I guess, I, you know, I said weak, he despised their weakness. That's definitely something that comes more in Yojimbo. Uh, there's definitely more of, of the... Uh, lead character and his his uh, getting upset with with these characters in that particular film mm -hmm. but in this particular film yeah i mean there is that interesting backstory element added which i think is a nice touch it does give an interesting uh you know it's, it's just an interesting bit to that story of him yeah. and uh you know and interestingly uh regarding his backstory there was um 
for the TV release that uh, that I, I think it was ABC when they released this film on TV. It was it played once. Um, they felt that this character was too despicable and there was no reason why he would go into this town and do all of this. And so they actually shot this prologue um, with Harry Dean Stanton and some other actor who kind of um, acted the, the part of Clint Eastwood, of Joe, where he, you never see his face through this whole, uh, this whole thing. You see his, you know, kind of from the back of him as he pulls the, the cigarette out of his head and nod, or out of his mouth and nods his head, things like that. It's, it's very silly. Um, but basically they felt that they needed to create this prologue for the film in order to give a reason as to why he's doing these things. And, and the, the whole thing was, you know, he's this, uh, kind of this soldier who, um, is you know his his uh, the you know the, his commander uh, Harry Dean Stanton is uh, um, having problems with this town because these two gangs and he needs somebody to go in there and uh, and kind of clean it up so that this town is uh, you know the people of this town can basically be saved and so he gives them this this heroic reason to go in and and cause this ruckus and everything and so. It's it's very silly. Uh, Monty Hellman actually directed it. It's not good at all, um, but it is an interesting little element to show just how uncomfortable people were when this film came out of dealing with this type of story well, and and, it, what, and this lack of morale. Well, and that's what's so fascinating about it because when you when you look at uh, how difficult it was to deal with what otherwise is essentially one of the most pure motivations. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what the film, what what I think Leone does in stripping away so much of the of the, um, uh, you know, the the typical Hollywood tripe um, is is give us is a very raw character, someone who's motivated by uh, greed and ego and id and wants to uh, satisfy some very base needs Um, and. You know, we end up seeing him, um, his his transformations that occur throughout the film. They go from uh, this sort of uh, lusty hooligan in the beginning when he first comes across Marisol uh, to you, you that he triggers this the mother complex. I mean, you end up watching him uh, sort of transform into this into the dutiful son and uh, ends up saving this family because of you know he is uh, adolescent all of a sudden and and i think that ends up being um, lending much depth as our our dear friend tommy handsome tends to say the movie is weirdly smarter than it needs to be uh, on that level and i think it makes it much more interesting yeah, and and there is an interesting religious element too that uh, I mean, Leone put in there. I don't think he was trying to say anything too big with it, but he created this family that you know their names are uh, Marisol, uh, Julian, and their child Jesus, mm-hmm. Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus. Um, so that's kind of the holy family, and uh, kind of just religious references throughout how how he uh, Joe. Um, needs to be killed and then is resurrected and is able to come, you know, come back from the dead, basically. And just like all these different elements that he created um, that I think were, I think from his mind were put into the film to just be kind of another layer to appeal to uh, some of his European audience. But now looking at it, it's just interesting looking at the story and looking at that kind of that motivation and everything how it kind of it, it it creates this story that does kind of transcend a little bit more and it, it isn't just a uh, a plain simple shoot 'em up western that so many other people had been churning out there is actually more to this and as much as tommy loves to say that i think that the thing that i like about all of these films where that ends up getting said is that it may be smarter than it needs to be, but I, I also feel like it's as smart as we deserve. You know, oh, I mean, there's, look there's, at you. Yeah, there's no reason that things have to be dumbed down, and I think Leone was catching on to that and saw that you know there is more 
of an interesting psychological element that you can put into a film when you actually explore those gray areas and you don't make just this black and white film. And clearly, he tapped into, uh, tapped into something because it became a thing. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And I think that's funny because when you say, when you hear people talk about spaghetti westerns, I think particularly for those who don't understand the genesis of the term, it becomes a diminutive. Uh, yeah. It becomes a way to say that, oh, they're just this just sort of sloppy schlock that, that uh, you know, that came out of this period in time. And sure, there was schlock. I mean, there were over 600 films uh, of this ilk between 1960 and 1980. And so of those, not uh, not all of them are great. Uh, but I think it's unfair to dismiss them, particularly when you have films that deal uh, in such a uh, sort of a pure way with impurity. Uh, and I think it's uh, it ends up being... Very sharp. I think it's really interesting looking at Eastwood as he comes off of this, uh, comes into this film where he was, and I, I was not a big Rawhide fan. Uh, I don't that, think I've ever seen an episode. It was, uh, I don't even know if it's, can, can you qualify that as like a Nick at Night thing? Where would I have seen reruns of Rawhide when I was young? I don't even know. I, uh, maybe Nick at Night. It feels like it was something that was on. I just never, I never watched it. But uh, but Eastwood was there and uh, he was in Rawhide and he was a good guy. Yeah, and this is, was... you know, his his comment uh, on this film was, in Rawhide, I did get awfully tired of playing a conventional white hat, the hero who kisses old ladies and dogs and was kind to everybody, and he decided it was time to be an anti-hero. Um, that, that ends up being kind of an interesting, uh, interesting statement for him, you know, coming into this film and then uh, sort of taking on that mantle, not just in this film, but as a as an actor. Uh who became really known for playing a lot of these more complex roles. Well, and I think, you know, I mean, look at Unforgiven. That was the film where Clint Eastwood at the, at the end of it, he, he says for Sergio and Don, uh, Don Siegel, two of his filmmaking mentors that mm -hmm. I think he learned a lot of his directing from and his storytelling style from, you really get a sense that this is a guy who, um, always found more interesting stories in the gray areas, in the psycholo psychology of what brought people to the places where they are, rather than just this simple black and white. And, uh, and yeah, it's, I think that it would be very hard for a person who does find kind of that gray area much more interesting uh, to get stuck in a role that is so black and white, like his role in Rawhide. It just, you know, you lose interest in playing that because it's just, you know, so, you know, milk toast. Milk toast. There's there's one you don't use often enough. Not often enough. No, that's the truth. Um, all right. Who else do you want to talk about in this film? Um, well, I think uh, it's Ramon? just a... Yeah, I think Ramon was a, is a great baddie, uh, played by uh, Gian Maria Volante. Um uh, he, you know, he's a, an actor who I guess was a, a very big, uh, like Shakespearean sort of actor in Italy, and he was in lots of uh, lots of uh, stage performances and and a lot of television and stuff. And uh, but I guess he was also very very political and ended. Uh, I, I mean, he did have a fairly big career, but he was very much the sort of person who, if you weren't kind of of his same political persuasion, then he just wouldn't be involved in the project. And so I guess he lost a lot of projects because of that and maybe didn't become as big a name as he potentially could have been because he was so adamant about uh, about his politics, uh, which I do find interesting and, and commendable, even if it is something that can you know, make or break a career, and and but you know, it's something that he stuck by his guns with, and uh, well, he made it into the abyss. <laughs> That's got to be something. In the abyss. Yeah. Well, it's not not the abyss <laughs> you're thinking of, uh, Andre Del Vau's film, uh, The Abyss. Uh, yeah. That of was course, the the other one. The other one. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. But did I have you for a second? Did I have you thinking? What was, was he like, in the uh, abyss? Yeah, yeah, I was like, what on earth are you talking Nothing. about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those, like, interesting performances when you look at uh, at, at his role in a, a Few Dollars More. I mean, this idea of, of these... Full of dollars? 
Uh, he has his phone dollars. <laughs> they all have dollars. He's, he is in for a few dollars more, yeah, which is weird. Let's make it more complicated. Uh, but but uh, you know, as these these guys, I mean, the, the, you know, the twists they pull on one another are, uh, you know, are interesting. I didn't find myself getting um, getting tired of his uh, roller coaster bravado. Yeah, uh, it was good. Yeah, I I really enjoyed him. I think that this is something where um, uh, uh, Leone purposefully wanted these two to kind of play opposite each other uh, in a big way. Um, Eastwood was so withdrawn and quiet, and actually he cut a lot of his own lines. He really wanted to, he felt like he didn't need to be saying as much as the script had him saying, so Eastwood really brought back his lines and became much quieter, and in turn, Leone had uh, had Ramon be much bigger and more uh, extravagant and much more of an actor, and just all of that, to so that when these two are together, it is it does create this very yin-yang sort of uh, relationship between the two of them which um, I really like. I mean, I, you know, some people may say he's a little over the top, but, you know, I, I like it. I think it works in context of this film, and I really do have a, a fun time watching all of his uh, kind of big antics. I do, too. Uh, but, uh, you know, none as entertaining, I think, as the, the, what ends up being the duo of uh, Silvanito and Piripero, uh, the innkeeper and the coffin builder. Mm-hmm. And I think those two are uh, wonderful um, sort of comic foils uh, throughout the film, and, but very subdued. I, mean, I think you don't get any of there, there's no real slapstick uh, involved, which sometimes you 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 know you you see the film sort of fall into the slapstick pattern for these foils. But but in this case, you know, in the case of the innkeeper uh, played by Jose Calvo. Um, you end up with a guy who is just generally sort of soberly presenting the facts. You are, you're in this town. Welcome to the town. I'm going to tell you about the world you've just entered. You are going to be killed. And uh, when you are killed, let me open this window and you can see what happens. And then we, we are introduced to the coffin builder who's just building cabin, building coffins. Uh, and they end up becoming this sort of lifeline to, uh, you know, to this universe. Uh, and, uh, to Joe's um, sort of welcome to it. And I, I really like it. I think they played that role sort of interestingly throughout. And the fact that the the uh, traditional sort of damsel in distress is played by, um, you know, Silvanito at the end who needs to be rescued, um, I think is a nice, um, is another nice twist. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's a, it is kind of a trio because there's also the bell ringer. Um, and the, you know, the bell ringer has a bigger yeah, role in, in Yojimbo, but he, he does kind of keep that trio here. Although the bell ringer just doesn't have much at all. It really focuses on Silvanito and his relationship with Joe, which is, I mean, it is a really nice relationship. I like the way that those two play, um, off of each other. And, you know, the, the grave digger has, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, sorry, the, the coffin maker, um, he has a really nice role too. Uh, you know, it's, it's different, but it is kind of, it, he, he's got a little bit of a funnier role, you know, just cause it's, you know, you know, hey, you're going to need to make three of those. Oh, I was wrong Four. Right. you know, just like all that sort of, uh, the comedy that goes along with making coffins in a town where everybody's killing each other. The only person who is making a buck right now. Right, so, right. so they are fun. They are fun. But it is, you're right, it is an interesting little twist at the end. Um, since we did have the resolution of the family getting rescued uh, partway through the film, it's nice having, you know, a, a damsel, damsel in distress, somebody that, that Joe needs to come in and rescue at the end. And it's, I think Silvanito is the right person for that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, and he gets his own little justice at the end as well. You know, did we sufficiently cover this notion of, of the her the hero in this film? Uh, this idea that, you know, what, what, uh, Leone is doing with the, the typical heroic journey. Well, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, he certainly does have to go through uh, a lot of the trials, but in this case, you know, the 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 hero is really kind of smarter than everybody else for most of the film. Right. He's only actually caught once. And uh, up to that point, uh, you know, he really just gets away with everything that he's trying to do, setting up 
all of this mischief to cause these two rival gangs to get at each other's throats, whether it's uh, you know, sneaking off with Marisol and delivering her to the other family, whether it's setting up the dead bodies in the in the cemetery and making them look like soldiers who are alive. Um, you know, he's always kind of coming up with something to uh, to lead people on, and he's always several steps ahead of them until that one moment when, by sheer bad luck, uh, the wagon wheel broke off, and so Ramon had to turn around and was back at home and saw that... Uh, that uh, Joe was not there and that he had, in fact, um, gone and taken Marisol to deliver her to her husband and son so that they could escape. And uh, and so, but yeah, it's there is that moment. And again, it's kind of that that biblical moment where this this character has to die and, you know, he gets brutally beaten. And it, not just, you know, I mean, it is brutal when I say brutal. I mean, they really are sadistic and uh, and awful and that's something else that I think struck people quite a bit when this film came out is that they're just so dang mean I mean you know putting their cigarette out on his hand grinding his hand with his, their boot heel uh you know just over and over pummeling him to the point of uh you know just horror really they really they really do and I you know I, apart from what they do from him I mean our first introduction to the true violence i mean beyond the the sort of showdown violence that we've already seen is is the the weapon exchange for gold you know when the the um, supposedly the um, you know us army is on one side of the river and uh, the mexican army is on the other and uh you know after they discover that the the mexican army is has dropped the gold uh they unleash the Gatling gun and just mow down everybody in the uh, in the uh, uh, Mexican army's uh, entourage. Mm-hmm. And it's only later that we discover that they had already that the quote U.S. Army was actually the the gang members and they were dressed as as uh, as soldiers, but had already killed all those soldiers and and uh, were about to lay them out uh, as if the you know there was a. Uh, there was a battle between them, interestingly, almost mirroring what uh, Joe is is attempting to do between these rival gangs, uh, have them mow each other down. Yeah. Um, that that sequence, the joy that you see uh, as they are, you know, gunning down that entire sort of regiment, uh, is also something that I think is novel to the to this burgeoning genre. It is, and it's definitely something that uh, I mean, people latched onto b- both, you know, other spaghetti western filmmakers over in Italy, um, who continued this, you know, this. I don't know if I'd call it a genre, but a subgenre. Right. The you know all of these you know just spaghetti westerns that came out in the rest of the '60s and into the '70s. And even over in our own country here in the U.S., a lot more uh, violence started popping up in films. It was, uh, you know, the height of uh, the 60s, and, you know, it just turned into something that people started showing more of in there and in, in the films. And I think that this was a big part. This film, there is a, uh, a an element of it that was inspired, that Leone was inspired by, by the James Bond films. Um, you can see that in the title sequence. I mean, it's got a, just a gorgeous title sequence in this film that is so fun to watch with all of its kind of rotoscoped uh, horse riding and gunfights and all that with uh, Ennio Morricone's just fantastic score uh, and just tons of whip cracks and, and uh, whistles and, and uh, all this uh, kind of choral singing of, of, I don't know, words you can't ever quite understand. And... Um, and it kind of this the Ennio Morricone music kind of has this rock and roll western sort of vibe to it, and I think that the violence kind of feels like it's kind of coming out of that too. I mean, the James Bond films weren't as as horrifically violent as this one was for the time, but that sensibility does seem to kind of drive from that type of film. Yeah, right. And and you know, it's funny about the music is they it, there's this sort of. Uh, almost subliminal chant, right? The we yeah. can fight, we can fight, right? It's it's pretty quiet, but it's one of those things that really sets this up as a as a um, uh, you know as a sort of a Norma Ray kind of a you know we're gonna rise up and and um, uh, you know it it gives you that sort of energy from the start uh, that I think is uh, I think is really 
fascinating way to set the tone for the film. Like you are, you're ready. Uh, you're ready for the fight before you even see the major characters cross the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got, we've got to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, cinematography of the film, most notably because, you know, you you see some of these. You know, sometimes we talk about the, you know, what do you note as a le- as a a particular director's uh, trademark? And uh, in this case, man, does Sergio Leone know how to choreograph a standoff? Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, and I know we will be talking more about this, particularly as we get to Good, Bad, and the Ugly. We've mentioned it before on the show, but this whole idea of how you characterize uh, the many competing different. Uh, parties in a high tension standoff and and the wonderful patience that that they show uh, leone and and cinematography by uh, massimo dalamano federico g laraya mm-hmm. um that uh, uh, you know the way they move the camera the way they cut uh, and pace their cuts i think is is uh, uh, really wonderful well, and it, it's not just the editing and the pacing of it, but just the the way that the the shots change from you know the wide shots, the gorgeous you know John yeah. Ford wide shots to those just intense close ups of the people's eyes as they look around. Particularly uh, the low li- angles, wonderful low angles. Yeah, there's that fantastic shot toward the end as Joe is walking toward the camera, and it's almost like his boot is about to kick the camera lens, like where the camera is on the ground, and his boot's about to kick it. And just as it's about to kick it, we cut to a a 180-degree reverse shot as his boot comes out of the camera and now is going away from the camera. And again, back to that ground-level shot. And then he stops and kind of turns, and you see just these boots standing there. And it's just like this this powerful shot of these boots, and you just get this sense of this, you know, just this powerful cowboy character who's just kind of like looming over you. and. Finding ways to shoot them like that or, or you know, getting those great Dutch angles of Clint Eastwood with a, a big building behind him as he chews his, his cigarillo and finding the, just these right ways to, to, to create this vision of the Old West that is so different from what we had seen in the years before. And that's what's so exciting about it. And I think that's what why you know, this trilogy and Leone and uh, the good spaghetti Western films all kind of stand out because they really did kind of give that, that injection of adrenaline that the uh, Western genre desperately needed to survive. That is it, that is exactly it, and I think you know you you mentioned the the close ups, which I think are are um, really beautiful, uh, you know, and and introduce kind of a narrative compression point, a visual compression point that increases the pressure, the intensity, that adrenaline. Uh, I think is is fantastic whenever they cut from a twitchy finger or a torso shot to those incredibly close up cropped eyes on that beautiful wide screen. I think it just, it, it really, uh, it, it delivers that shot. The other one that he does often is this, the, the, uh, like the weapon point of view shot, you know, where right. he's, where you're actually, you know, at hip level as, uh, Eastwood is, is, you know, gunning down these guys and, and, uh, they do it early on in the film and then they do it again. Uh, you know, when he, he first kills some of the, the Rojas guys. And then uh, again, as he, as he kills, uh, kills, them at the end by the um, in the town square there you see him uh sort of expertly excise everybody except his primary target which is uh, which ends up being a really beautiful kind of dramatic fall yeah uh, i love it uh and then the the final uh sequence that i think was is really jarring for me is um is the uh, the death of ramon uh at the end Mm-hmm. Uh, as as we go into his POV and we see and the camera begins to spin around up and and around and down and and Eastwood or, or Joe is it is sort of comes into focus and then out and then it, it, you know it we reverse the point of view and we see him with just the blood coming out of his mouth and then finally he falls uh, onto the well um, I that I find just a really delightfully nauseating ten seconds. Well, and it's a really interesting point to all of a sudden bring point of view into the film. Yes. 
you know, we've never been in anybody's head and to all of a sudden step into our antagonist's head the moment he's dying and we get these fantastic kind of swirly shots of the sun and just as his as he's kind of spinning uh, you know, dazedly as he's uh, slowly dying. I mean, it really took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting that at all. And I found it such a, like you were just saying, uh, just a moment that was very strong and um, really brought home for me that moment that much more because that was just an unexpected twist to the filmmaking style that that really emphasized that moment in the storytelling. Yeah, what's you know what's most interesting about it for me is that it it puts uh, once again you know we talk about how all of these groups in this film are are bad you know from from Eastwood to the gangs they're they're all on the scale uh, closer to you know gray. Uh, and and what we have in that final sequence, choosing to go to POV of the antagonist, is sort of a reset of um, you know any expectation that that we aren't willing to give fair time to all the bad people. Um, you know that in in this case, these are not only are these equal players in the standoff, they are equal players in the sentimentality or the intention of the film and particularly of the scene. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and again, uh, playing in that gray area makes it a, a more compelling, um, more compelling sequence. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, all right. We've got Ennio McCorney. We talked about cinematography, editing. What, who else do you want to talk about? Um, I, you know, just, a, another note of cast, um, uh, Marianne uh, Koch, K- Coke. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce her last name, um, playing Marisol. Um, I mean, it's a very minor role. I don't have much to say about her other than the fact that I do find this very interesting. Uh, the way that Leone would make these films is he would cast people from kind of all over the world. I mean, she was at the time one of Germany's top stars. And, uh, you know, there were Italian actors, Spanish actors, American actors. There were actors from, like, all through Europe in this film, uh, you know, Greek. And they, um, they came together and they made this film. And oftentimes, when they would make these movies, they would not film the audio. Or they would kind of have kind of a, just a scratch track that they would film while they were actually filming that they could refer to in the editing. Because what they would then do is they would go back and actually have everybody record their clean lines uh, in their in the post sessions so that they could have clean audio. And a lot of these people, when they were actually speaking, would be speaking in their own languages. So it made it hard to understand like what other people were actually saying when you were actually doing your your part in the filming. Like you'd be, you know, Clint would say his English line, and then one of the other actors would respond speaking Spanish, and he would just have to remember, okay, as soon as they say that, then I say this. And so it was very, very distracting. And lines were changing a lot, too. And, and Clint said he was very lucky to have thought about writing down all of his lines when he changed them all through the script, because by the time he got to the recording booth to listen to the uh, the um, actual um, scratch tracks, all of that had been lost. And so he would either have had to read his lips or they would have just written new lines, but he had his lines written down. So he was able to remember what he said in all of the <laughs> shots that they ended up using. But uh, but it's an interesting filmmaking style where they do this. And, and you can certainly tell. I mean, it's definitely something that we'll see all through these films where you just, you know, you're pretty much nobody's sync really quite lines up because they record all the all the lines separately and some people aren't even using like i I think for ramon i don't think gian maria volante actually did his own lines in this film no i don't think think so i I think many of them are not and what's really funny is if you like i i found myself switching language tracks um because you know if you watch it in english clint's lines up perfectly but if you watch it in spanish um clint's no longer does but a number of other characters do and and French, you know, sort of the same thing. You can jump around these language tracks and and kind of learn the nationality of these characters because right. because suddenly their sync lines up better. It's a, it, right. it's a really funny um, funny experience. I were, were all three of these films made this way. I thought it was just the first yes. two, and that uh, really so good. Ben, the I'm ugly was sure also synced. Yeah, well, that, that's um, that's I'm it's pretty a sure really it was. Interesting, yeah. really interesting yeah. style. So. Yeah, it was, uh, it was yes. very big in, in, in Italian filmmaking at the time. They did that a lot, and uh, 
Uh, you know, I think it was just easier for them to just go in and because because they, they're going to be creating a sound mix anyway, and so they would just record all the lines. Uh, well, I so. have to imagine practically it just it, you know clearly in this film it opens them up to um, you know to a talent pool that they don't have access to in Italy. Uh, right. You know, for these sorts of films, the fact that they bring Clint Eastwood over, who, who brings over many of his props, like the gun was his rawhide gun, you know, I'm, right. the, the, you know, he found all these things in the United States and then is suddenly in this Italian Western film, um, you know, that's access to a talent pool they don't, they don't usually see. So, right, right. Yeah, fascinating. Anybody else on your list? Uh, no other people. Oh, but clearly you're teasing. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh huh. Uh, where, what would you like to say? Well, I, you know, bringing up uh, a website we haven't talked about recently, but the old Internet Movie Firearms Database. <laughs> I, didn't, I totally didn't see that coming. <laughs> it's been so long, like a breath of fresh air. I know. I can't remember where we lost. I feel like it was a Clint Eastwood movie that uh, we It might have been. About. Oh, my yeah. goodness. That's funny. What, but yeah, where, so, yeah, please tell. <laughs> so there were uh, there were a number of weapons used in this. Uh, most prominently, you know, as as we as they point out <laughs> during the climax, the uh, the pistol and the rifle. Those two are clearly kind of the the predominant weapons in this. Uh, Clint has the uh, single action army, uh, the five and a half artillery, and then it's got a, a color case hardened frame that has a fantastic rattlesnake grip on it, which is. Just just a, a gorgeous little gun. Not that I'm a gun guy. I don't. I don't know why I find this so <laughs> fascinating, but but I do. Uh, and then uh, yeah, so he had that, and then uh, I think some of the other people, uh, some of the other soldiers, had similar sorts of guns. And then uh, Ramon was using two different Winchesters, a Winchester 1892 and a Winchester 1894. I think it's supposed to be one gun, but they actually interchanged it a few times. They also have the. Uh, 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 Mitra, I don't know how you say it, Mitrailus machine gun. Uh, that, <laughs> you it's sound actually, great. Do I sound nice yeah. and French? Yeah. That was the one that uh, Ramon mows down the all the troops with. And it's a fake one. It doesn't look quite right, uh, according to these experts on this website. But um, it does kind of, uh, um, it's pretty close to what the Mitrailus machine gun looks like. And then uh, some of the other troops are using Mauser 1895s, and there's 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun in there that, uh, that uh, the bartender uses and stuff. So it's, uh, yeah. it's got a share of uh, fun little weapons in it. But I, I'm a particular fan of Clint's single-action single army uh, 45. There's nothing like having a rattlesnake uh, on, your, uh, on your grip. Yeah, okay. And you're right. <laughs> Are you going to pull those pistols or whistle Dixie? <laughs> That's right. The last time we talked about the uh, Internet Firearm Database, Internet Movie Firearm Database, The Outlaw Josie Wales. Ah, uh, yes. There mm -hmm. you go. Episode 79. Well, there you go. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes to the Fistful of Dollars page. That's fantastic. Yeah. Man, nice pull. Ah, I thought I'd jump back there again. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last thing that I think is worth mentioning is that this actually was remade one more time. It actually was Yojimbo that was officially remade in 1996 as Last Man Standing by Walter Hill. Do you remember that movie? Last Man Standing? Was that, uh, uh, what? what's his name, Moonstruck? Uh, yeah, Bruce Willis. Yeah, Bruce Willis. <laughs> Bruce Willis, Bruce Dern, uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, just a bunch of other people. It takes place in, uh, in like the prohibition, 40s. prohibition era Texas. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. coming back to me. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was a gangster. He he was kind of a scruffy hitman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he went from a scruffy Ronin to a scruffy gunslinger to a scruffy hitman. That's funny. I don't yeah. rem I don't remember having an opinion about the film. I don't remember liking it, and I think in in general it's kind of considered the worst of all of these versions. But it actually, after having watched Yojimbo and A Fistful of Dollars uh, just recently, I am now curious to go back and revisit Last Man Standing just to see if there is anything good about it at all. I I'm not going to watch Last Man Standing again. I don't I don't have a good memory. <laughs> And the poster it's looks Walter dumb. It's Walter Hill. It's Walter Hill, though. I've got to think that there's something good about it when Walter Hill is behind it. I mean, he's you know he's got some 
some kind of he's got some cred (laughs) he's got some cred (laughs) all right all right fair enough can we talk about numbers yes let's do it how'd it do uh you know it's it's hard to tell how how it did um internationally because i couldn't find anything that really I, I found some italian numbers it looked like it did really well in italy in 1964 when it was released um it didn't cost very much the film only cost $200,000 in 1964 it dollars i am guessing that that was an a conversion from Ital- italian uh, to American, um, that would have been about one point four million dollars. So you know, kind of a low budget western. They were actually using sets from another uh, another western, uh, like a bigger budget western. This was kind of considered the B picture. So they had to use all the sets from this other film that had just been shot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was released in the U.S. in 1967. It took a few years for United Artists to get it, but it was released and it did well for itself. It really found an audience. It grossed about $14.5 million, um, which adjusted is like uh, $101 million. So it did really well for itself. And that's just in the U.S. I can only imagine that if I could find numbers for the rest of the world, that it would be much higher on our list. Oh, and not to mention that, that when Kurosawa got the rights to this to release in Japan and got the worldwide or 15% of the worldwide rights. He ended up making more money on this film than he did on any of his other films that he had done. So, uh, you know, kudos to him for (laughs) making sure he won that suit, (laughs) you know, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, this film did really well for itself. And if I could have found all the rest of the numbers, it would have been even higher on our list as it is. It's, it's number 40. Well, that's still pretty high. Yeah, it's still That's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I I quite enjoyed it, and uh, I'm I'm. It makes me very excited to see these other two films because I I don't I, I think I've only seen this maybe twice, um, the Fistful of Dollars, but I have seen the other two more, and so um, uh, this makes me uh, really excited to see them all back to back. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, shall we rank it? Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you can find our stack rankings of all of our favorite films. Make sure to like us or friend us or whatever you do and uh, uh, see if your ranking lines up with ours. And you know, I haven't mentioned this, but we are st- in a long time, but we are still uh, posting over at Letterboxd. That's obviously where we have our upcoming uh, upcoming movies uh, list. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, good action going over there at Letterboxd. So you should uh, like us over there too if you're a Letterboxd user. Absolutely. All right. Let's do it. Okay. A Fistful of Dollars or The Born Supremacy? Oh. Huh. Well, that's a context it's, shift. <laughs> it really is. Ah, uh, man, I don't know. I, I really enjoy both of them. I, I feel I, I enjoy both of them. Neither of them are the favorite, uh, are my favorite in the in in their this series. series. Yeah. Right, yeah. I feel like I would go Born Supremacy, though. Why? I don't it, know. Just because it's modern? You fear maybe. The, you fear age? <laughs> Not really in context <laughs> with this one, but well, maybe I do a little bit with the, the you know, the, the lack of women folk in this film. Yeah, they really do. Uh, this, uh, this was very dated. In, in, in the, yeah, in yeah. terms of how they uh, involve the females in the story. It yes. definitely is. <laughs> yes, it really is. All right, I'm going to give you more in two. That's okay. good. Okay. Fistful of Dollars or The Sandlot? Oh, Fistful of Dollars. Yeah, absolutely. Fistful of Dollars or Pale Rider? Oh, there you go. Oh. I would do... Hmm. I, I got to do Pale Rider. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning that way. I, I feel a little guilty, but I, I, you know, there's something interesting about Pale Rider. All yeah. right, let's do that one. Fistful of Dollars or Buckaroo Banzai? <laughs> I'm totally doing Fistful of Dollars. Oh, me too. But you don't have to be so happy about it. I, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I, I didn't like making that choice, I mean. That's good, because, you know, <laughs> meanie. I know. Fistful of Dollars or Thief? Fistful of Dollars. Yeah. Fistful of Dollars or The Born Legacy? I would do Fistful of Dollars. 
That's the Jeremy Renner number four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Fistful of dollars. All right. Uh, a fistful of dollars or quarantine? Oh. Fistful of dollars. Yeah, I would agree with you there. All right. Hey, look at that. Number 92 out of 145. 92. I, that actually surprises me. Actually, I thought it, I thought it would be higher. Yeah, I think it was that uh, you know, born that, yeah, that first... right out of the gate that uh, kind of kept it in the back half yeah. there. All right. Well, but you know what? We have, I think, well over a hundred movies that we like on this list, so yes. it's hard. You know, yeah, I no. don't feel too bad. No, I know. I'm I'm getting over that yeah. each week. <laughs> uh, I uh, any other uh, any other comments uh, about this film before you tell us uh, more about where we go from here? I think that's all. The only funny thing that I I think that I want to say is that this is it's you know they call this the Man with No Name trilogy. They also call it the Dollars trilogy, and I think in both cases they're wrong because in his character has a name or a nickname in every single one of these films and only two of these films specifically reference dollars in the title so neither neither uh you know trilogy name is is really perfect um but and, you know i just think it's funny that you know united artists latched onto that uh after these first two films were released and and said oh this is the man with no name yeah, even though he's called Joe in this film, so. But you know what's interesting, Marketing and I, I, have to, I have to check this. I think you can sort of get away with that because he doesn't give himself a name in any of these films. Yeah, other people call him Joe right. or Bondi or whatever. So right? I think that's. I think that's. I think that's fair. Well, and far to be, be fair, it from me to tell you to go easy on a big studio, but. <laughs> That, to be fair, the script was originally called The Magnificent Stranger, you know, so it does yes. it does lend itself to kind of a man with no name sort of vibe. Um, and I think it works really well. I mean, The Man with No Name does have a great ring to it, even if it isn't completely accurate, but yes. I'll forgive them. Okay. Well, you're a very kind and generous. Yes. <laughs> but yes, we, we are going to be continuing the Man with No Name trilogy with the next one for a few dollars more. Mm -mm. yes sir all right i guess that's it then (laughs) i i always i always think of this film um with back to the future three as a pairing for some reason Uh, for a few dollars more no a fistful of dollars a fistful of dollars with back to the future three because of the western thing in the train and no because he references it directly by seeing it and remembering oh hey he's going to put that thing under his poncho to protect himself from getting shot which then Marty McFly does. Holy died. smoke. I totally forgotten that part. Yeah. I yeah. had totally forgotten that part. I didn't think very much of the third Back to the Future movie. Oh, really? Well, you know. We're going to have to do that trilogy now. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, you know, if I gave it any thought, I probably would. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. I enjoy the third one. I think I enjoy it more than the second one. Oh, no. Hover, hoverboard. <laughs> You're clearly wrong because hoverboard. <laughs> All right. Uh, Good night, Andy. I got to go to bed. All right. Have a good night. Are you happy with your choice? I am. Do you want to go first? Sure. All right. This is by a customer who gave it one star and said, this was the worst movie I have ever seen. This person <laughs> clearly is an idiot. A fistful, of, <laughs> a fistful of Dollars was the worst movie I have ever seen. Not even a great actor like Clint Eastwood can make this movie good. The movie doesn't have any speed. When the first thing happens, you is awake. But right after that, you fall asleep and you never wake up again. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't see this movie. <laughs> or you will be asleep. <laughs> you never wake up again.
Yes, and you can tell that it's uh, somebody, well, surprisingly, this was written in 1999, but they don't spell U, Y-O-U. They spell it with just the letter U. Wow. I was convinced for sure that it was a modern review because of the texting U, U but no, 99. Oh, well, mine that, that is... That even sadder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mine is uh, meh, and uh, it's uh, three star. Uh, and I'm reading it uh, n- not necessarily because of the weight of the review itself, but because of the it, it's it it's got some titular uh, pun going on here that I Ooh. I think is worth sharing. The good, the bad, and the ugly was iconic. This one, not so much. Characters are far too two dimensional. My ten year old aptly noted that we wasted a small fistful of dollars on this movie and thought it unwise to waste a few dollars more on the third in the series. Now. Before you say anything, a response to that uh, actually gets some uh, offers a correction. Sequel? This isn't a sequel. It was the first of the trilogy. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly was the final film in the trilogy. People might take your review seriously if you at least knew what you were talking about. Ouch. Snarky. Uh, so, uh, you don't want to waste a few dollars more. Very clever. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amazon. Andy, it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. I love The Next Reel Season 4. Do you know why? I don't. Why? Because we got to talk about my favorite movie, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That's not even an adaptation. Uh, No, but it was such a great part of our our great Terry Gilliam series. And a few others in that series were adaptations, like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, adapted from Raspi's stories, and La Jete, which inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, right. And and for our Man With No Name trilogy, we saw how Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars was basically stolen from Kurosawa's Yojimbo. We added Labor Day to our Jason Reitman series, adapted from Joyce Maynard's novel. Oof, there's one we'll always regret. Our big Stephen King series covered adaptations like The Shining, Cujo, Christine, and Stand By Me, great horror, and coming-of-age tales. Another Coen Brothers adaptation, too. We got to talk about how they turned Homer's The Odyssey into Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? For our holiday series, we did The Bishop's Wife and The Poseidon Adventure. And who could forget seeing Alec Guinness in the adaptation of Kind Hearts and Coronets during our series dedicated to him. We really need to do more of his films. Truly. We had our first film noir series with classics like Double Indemnity, Detour, and Out of the Past. And our black and white cinematography of James Wong Howe series with The Thin Man, Sweet Smell of Success, Seconds, and King's Row. So many adaptations. Oh, you're not kidding. Dive deeper into these originals and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support our show. Get the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and start reading today. (laughs) 